Okay, so previously we went over these slides. We talked about option buyers and sellers. The leverage, the, okay. We left off on how a call contract works. So last class we covered the basics of options and now we left off the specifics of how the contract works. So a call option, which we're calculating today in class, gives the holder or the buyer the right to buy a stock at a certain price. So we're, we're paying for, think of it, the, the option as a written contract that you sign at the bottom and then they have a contract that says, you're gonna pay me for this contract and in the contract you have the right to buy the stock at a certain price. So this contract though, because it's standard through the exchange, you could go and then sell it to her if you're done with it. And the value of the contract changes as the value of the stock changes or as the time before expiration changes. Um, so if you're the buyer, you want the stock price to go up. And if you're the seller or the writer of the contract, you want the stock price to go down. Because then it won't execute, you won't owe any money. So the price of the underlying asset um, if the price of the underlying asset goes above the strike price, you have a profitable contract, which means you could buy it at a lower price and sell it at a higher price. Um, the option person who, who writes the contract has to sell it to you at the strike price because that's written in the contract and the strike price does not change. And the due date of the contract does not change. The only thing that changes is the stock price of the stock and the premium or the, the value of the contract will change in time. Now, if the seller, who the guy who actually, I don't like to say seller because it's confusing, the writer, the person who actually writes the contract to sell to you, if they don't own the stock, it's called a naked call, it means that they don't already own the stock. However, if they do own the stock, which means they have it sitting here ready to sell it to you for the strike price of the contract, it's called a covered call. And those are much less risky because if the stock price goes up, I already bought it probably at a lower amount and I have it. So no matter what, I'm making a profit on this contract. If I don't own the stock and make a naked position and the stock price goes up very high and I promise to sell it to you at a lower price, you know, say I promise to sell you the Xbox um, One at $375 but I don't own it, and now it's trading at $100 on eBay, they run out of stock, I have to go and buy an eBay to sell for $1,000 to sell it to you for $349 or $375. Not a good deal for me. So the naked calls are a lot more riskier than the covered calls. So, if the, so the, the buyer, um, I'll let the contract expire uh, and just lose the premium. So if the contract becomes into a position where I'm not gonna make money on the stock price, like we saw today in the handout, I'll just let it expire and I'll just lose the cost of the contract. Just like you would lose the cost of the milk if you didn't use the milk and you let it expire. Unless you're one of those people that doesn't mind drinking expired milk. I'm not one of those. Um, are you kidding me? You see this? Don't wanna curse on camera, but. It starts with a B, first word is a B, second word is an S. Uh, the seller uh, will keep the premium and any profit the contract makes. So if you're the seller selling you that contract, even if you let the contract expire, I still keep the premium. So you could be very lucrative as, as a, what we call the seller, like I like to call the writer or the maker of the contract. I could be making these contracts left and right and selling them to everybody and just collecting all that premium. And that could be my job as long as stock prices don't go up. So in a bear market, writing, covered, writing naked calls is probably a very profitable thing to do. In a bear market, writing covered calls is not profitable because if the stock price falls, you'll make money in the contracts, but you'll lose money in the stock you own. This is an example that we, we actually did this uh, by hand today in class, so I don't have to read over this example, but this is the same thing. So if you wanted actual formulas, to some of the stuff we did in class, the textbook has some alternate formulas about how to calculate the profit. If you're the type of person, I like to think of these problems more logically, uh, more intuitively, like what am I selling, what am I making, and just knowing the mechanics of what's happening. You may, might feel more comfortable at first using some of the formulas in the textbook, but it's always easier to understand the mechanics of what's happening and calculate it from the transactional side. That way you'll never be confused or use the wrong formula. But one important thing is that this is a zero sum game, which means that whatever money I make as the 
as the writer of the contract, you lose. And any, any money that you make as the person who purchases the contract, me, the writer, would lose. So nobody else makes money but the two people on the two sides of the contract. The exchanges make money through commissions and, and fees for going through them, uh, sort of like eBay. You know, so the exchange, eBay will make money, but the transaction costs and profits are between me and you. Okay. So the leverage we talked about, if I only need um, $500 to invest to get a, a position of, say, 100 shares of a stock, and I make a $2,000 profit on the option, I can get a 400% return. However, if I have to pay the full price, $5,000, $50,000 for the stock, because I'm buying it outright, and I make the same profit or more, uh, maybe a higher profit because I'm not paying a premium, I still only get a 5% return. So the leverage is, with the contract, the premium is a small, a small cost compared to the entire value of owning that stock. So I could pay $10,000 to own a stock or $100 to buy an equivalent in the contract. So I'm greatly leveraged. And that helps increase the profit percentage return. So people who trade in options or use options to represent their stock purchases can be, have much higher leverage positions and much higher profit percentage returns. So I could either buy you know, one share of Google for $600 or one contract worth a value of 100 shares of Google for $600. So now I'm like 100 times leveraged. And that's going to, if the, stock, the contract moves up $1, I make $1 by owning the stock or, or $100 by owning the contract. Okay. And this, uh, this example, again, is what we did in class. We don't need to go over that. The put contract is a short position. It's, it's resembling a short position. So if you buy a put contract, you have, you're buying the right to sell a stock short. So what you want is the stock price to go down. So you could sell it at a higher price than what you would buy to settle the position. So in a put contract, just like a short sell, you want the price of the stock to go down. Now if you're the one who writes the contract, you want the price of the stock to go up because that means your contract won't be executed and you won't have to deliver. And you just keep the premium and can skip away nice and happy. So a put contract is just the inverse of a call contract. And many of the formulas are the inverse as well. You know, and you just remember, if you remember how a short, a short position works, you'll understand how a put contract works because it's really the only thing different is that you're paying a premium and you have the right to sell short, not an obligation. So you could let the contract expire if you wanted to. So if the, the, if the price of the stock, what they call the underlying asset, but I'm saying the stock, if that goes below the option strike price, I'm making money. Um, if the price of the asset goes up, that's, that's a bad thing in a short position. You never want to have a short position and the asset goes up. So you can see how risky it is if you have a short position in the real stock market and the assets go up, you can lose unlimited amounts of money. So sometimes buying a put contract to represent a short position is a much safer because you, you could only lose the premium. On the, the writer side, you do, have, um, if, you, know, you do have a lot more exposure, but it's limited to the stock going down to zero. So the only exposure you have on, on, the, on the put contract as a writer is from whatever the price of stock is to zero. That's the most you could lose. So lots, lots of times the, the put writers don't buy a covered position because there's a, only a, they know a finite amount of what they can lose. It's not unlimited like the call. A naked call contract is, a, is open for unlimited losses where the put contract isn't. But still, ideally, you would want the, if, you would want the contracts to settle in a position where you make, as the writer, the maximum amount of money. And the writer of the contract is sort of like the house odds. The odds are in favor of the writer of the contract, not the purchaser of the contract. Just like when you go to a slot machine or a blackjack table or the roulette wheel, the odds are in the house's favor. And that's why these casinos are so big and make so much money, because the, the chances are that they'll win most of the time. And the writers of the contract are the same thing. So if you want to make money in options, you should be the option writer, not the purchaser of the options. 
because the rider makes more money because the odds, the percentages of chance are stacked in the rider's favor, not in the owner's favor. When they calculate the call premium, which we'll, go, we'll get to in a second, and again, the put mechanics of how the, the profit and loss are calculated in the put contract, we did that again in that handout in today's class. So I'm going to skip those slides. Um, the put premium or the call premium is made up of what I said earlier, intrinsic value and time value. The more chances you have every day of making money, the bigger the time value of the, the premium will be. And the intrinsic value is just a straight up value of the difference between the, the stock and the strike price. Now, the time value is not, you can't factor that in straight days alone. The time value is connected to say the beta or the risk of the stock. So the riskier stocks will have large, say both stocks could have a five days until expiration. The riskier stock will have two or three times the amount of time premium than the less risky stock. So volatility also increases time value as well as length of time the contract expires. Now these contracts, don't worry, I'll keep an, oh, we only have 10 seconds left. I'll finish this slide and we'll finish it up on uh, Monday. The, um, the options trade on exchanges a lot like the stock markets, the New York Stock Exchange, the American, the NASDAQ, but the options have their own, stock, their own exchange called the CBOE, Chicago Board of Exchange. So they trade most of the option contracts on that exchange and it's not too much different than a, a stock exchange. It's pretty much the same mechanics. Um, okay, so we're out of time for class today. I'll finish this lecture on Monday. Plus, uh, have a great Thanksgiving. And let me uh, stop this.